I'm not the Irish Brian Cox, I hate that. <laughs> no, it's great to be here. Big thanks to Jules for asking me. About a year ago, Jules said, come and do this. I said, yes, not knowing there'll be profanity in the chapel. Surely there's some rule against playing, you know, get lucky in the chapel. That seems like against the law. But it's great to be here. Big thank you to Jules. I'm very happy to say a few words to you. And I'm going to read him. Um, any scientists here? Silence. You're all, we're all scientists, really. I'm going I'm I'm to tell you why science is great and how the future needs science more than ever is my bottom line. Because um, science has all these wonderful things for society, and let's hope it continues. I thought I'd start with this. I'm in a chapel. Isn't that great? The end is nigh. Now, as you know, we're wrecking the planet, aren't we? So we're going to try and talk about climate change a bit as a, as a sort of a, a key topic for the moment. And really, I'm here to plug my book shamelessly. Now, luckily, Jules is going to give one to everybody in the audience. Am I right, Jules? No. Um, I was lucky enough to publish a book last year called Humanology, which is the science of being a human being and what it is to be a human and the whole scientific basis for the human condition. And I'm going to try to talk a bit about that tonight, I suppose, as I go through my various topics. Now, let me start with this, though. This is the most important picture ever taken, people say. It was the Apollo mission, Apollo uh, 8 in uh, 1968. There is the Earth, you see. And isn't it amazing? They say this is the most important thing. There's the little blue marble in the distance. Neil Armstrong, when he was on the moon, he said he put his thumb up and he got rid of the earth with his thumb, right? And he said it didn't, didn't make him feel great, it made him feel very, very small. He was absolutely terrified that that earth thing down there could be blotted out. It gets worse, get ready for this one. Now the earth is in this picture, in case you don't know. That was the Voyager mission in 1990, he took a picture of the earth, there it is, six billion kilometers away. That tiny white dot is the Earth. Now, for heaven's sake, what is wrong with us? You know, we worry about things, don't we? We're a tiny, tiny speck in the universe, a little white dot, you know. So let's stop wrecking the planet. Let's, let's join together now and make that little dot something important is the message I want to give you for that one. And look at this, one of our great graduates, Samuel Beckett. Uh, you're on Earth. There's no cure for that. So get on with it, right, is the message here. Now, um, also, this is stuff I just put in this afternoon. This was the first ever picture of a, big, of, of a black hole, right? And there was great excitement of the first ever image of a black hole. Now, for heaven's sake, it's black, right? What's the big deal? Um, the scientists who saw this call this the gates of hell, the scientists who first visualized the black hole. Again, very appropriate in a church. You see, don't be frightened now. Maybe that black hole will suck us all in eventually. We'll all die. There's a cheery prospect. Now... To be more positive for a minute, um, how do you address the question from a scientific point of view, what is it to be human? There are three sub-questions. The first is, where do we come from? The second is, what are we? And the third is, where are we going? I'm going to address all three tonight now in 10 minutes, terrifyingly. This is Paul Gauguin's famous painting. Remember, art and science is the same thing. Artists try to answer those three questions through art. We try to answer as well through science. And let's, let's go through them one by one. First of all, where do we come from? I hope you all realize that story of two hippies and a talking snake is wrong, as you may know. Um, life evolved on Earth about 4.2 billion years ago. There are these creation myths. The Aborigines think a rainbow serpent shook the Earth into life. That may be true. If you're a scientist, show me the snake. If not, shut up. Science's motto is take nobody's word. The Royal Society, the world's oldest scientific society, 1660, Robert Boyd, an Irish guy, was a founder. Take nobody's word, show me the evidence. That's what science is, show me evidence. Now we now know, and here's the evidence, uh, the Earth began about 4.5 billion years ago. The first life was 4.2 billion years ago. It arose through chemical reactions, like a bubbling cauldron gave rise to the first cell. We know that because this guy, Stanley Miller, did an experiment. He stuck into this vessel, the Earth's early atmosphere. If you go back 4.2 billion years, there was hydrogen, methane, and ammonia and water. He put them in this vessel. He sparked electricity through electrodes. He bubbled it up with special, you know, Bunsen burner. Let it circulate for a week. That's all he did. He came back a week later. Guess what had happened after a week? With those very simple three building blocks, what had happened? A tiny creature crawled. That's a joke. Uh, he uh, found amino acids. Now, they're very complex biochemicals that make life. Life is just a chemical reaction. The first cell arises. There's a paper he published in 1953 on that very thing, the same year as a double helix by Watson and Crick. That's the information question solved, I suppose. First cell arises. 
evolution happens and you get to us, right? You finally arrive at us as a species. That's the truth. 99.9% .9 certain is what science has told us. Now, I gave it this lecture, a similar one in Mount Joy Jail, about three months ago. The, the, the librarian there said, your book is in the library and the lads, she called them, love it. Would you come in and talk to them, right? And I went in and spoke to them. And it was the most vivid experience of this whole book plugging business, right? Um, and uh, I gave this lecture and they were all sitting there, maybe 100 men. It's a terrifying place to visit. Your heart breaks for these men st staring at you. And I started by saying the earth is 4.5 billion years old. That's a very long time. And this guy shouted, not as long as three years in here. Right. And then they gave me a carved version of the cover of my book. These two young guys very anxiously came to me and gave me this wonderful uh, cover. And if anything, that experience made the book worthwhile on its own. Now, we get to life on Earth. There may be life on other planets. There's Enceladus. There's evidence maybe of life on that moon going around Saturn. Um, and then, of course, we arrive as a species 200,000 years ago. Uh, we leave Africa 100,000 years ago. This morning, Simon made a great point, I thought. A single tribe left Africa 100,000 years ago and then populates the entire planet and fights the whole time. Isn't it terrifying? These tribes break up. We go to Asia. We make the biggest mistake of all time. We invent Americans 12,000 years ago. We're still trying to escape the horror of that. Um, but life then populates the Earth. Um, we meet Neanderthals and Denisovans. There's the great science on this. And then eventually, in 1492, we build a ship and go and visit our relatives in America, right? That's a family reuniting, a family that had separated 60,000 years ago. There was a separation point. Now, what do we do? We kill them. Isn't that marvelous? We go to Australia, we kill our cousins there as well. What is wrong with human beings? A big topic for this session, I suppose. But that's the truth of it. Horrendous in many ways when you think about it. Now, here's the time scale. If life on Earth is a 24-hour period, we arrive at one minute to midnight. We're recent people. We're recent life form that's come to Earth, and we're wrecking the place, which is ridiculous. All this fantastic evolution could be destroyed in this way. Now, that's the question where do we come from? Very simple. Chemistry makes cells. Cells make humans. Job done. Second question, what are we? More complicated, you know. And I talk about attraction. I talk about raising children, gender, music, humor, religion, aging. All these make us human beings. And let's go through one or two of them. Um, the bit on attraction has got the most attention. It's a mystery what makes us attracted to someone else. It's a fantastically interesting psychological question. Um, it's all hormones. Don't worry. You get a surge of dopamine, and then you're turned on, or you make oxytocin, and then you bond to someone. It's all chemicals again. It's very awfully un unromantic, isn't it, in many ways? But that's the truth of it. You know, we're a machine made of hormones and chemicals. And then, of course, music defines us. Wasn't it great, all the music that Jules organized today? There's the oldest instrument ever. That's off a mammoth bone 55,000 years ago. The poor old mammoth is dead, didn't care, but his bone survives. Um, our brains light up on music. It's a real trait of humans. Singing in a choir is the most beneficial thing you can do. Wards off Alzheimer's, for example. So we love music. That book uh, goes there. Religion, let's mention it briefly. Now, if you're a scientist, religion is an evolved trait that allows us to survive. That's all it is. So in other words, it gives us various advantages. The Turing Shroud, it's always a big mistake when science and religion talk to each other because the Turing Shroud is from the year 1200. That was a big error to try and date that. Um, so an evolved trait means it gives you advantages. If there was a gene for religiosity, it could persist in the population. That's the scientific view. There are other views, of course. The second reason for religion are drugs. Now, did you know the Irish monks took magic mushrooms? And that inspired the great art of the Book of Kells, you see. There's evidence of psilocybin in some of the monks' vessels. It's no surprise that many religions are founded by someone who starves themselves for 40 days and starts, starts to hallucinate, you see. So that's the, that this is only one next to me. There could be others. I'm sure Jules has a different view, but scientifically, that's probably what religion is. This guy invents LSD. Uh, he has the biggest trip of his life. He becomes an absolute religious person on a trip, you see. So these drugs affect our brains. That's one possibility. Now, aging. You're all getting older as this lecture goes on. I'm sure you are aging more quickly now. Um, that creature lives to be 1,500 years old. It's called a hydra. This worm was modified. A single gene was changed in this worm. It lived four times as long. Isn't that amazing? We have the same gene. We could easily live longer if we manipulate our genes. The oldest woman ever, 122 years, Jean Calment. Aging is a fascination, as a trait. And there's all these studies of people who've lived to be over 100. Uh, there's a place called Akaroli in Italy. They're called blue zones. One's in the US, one's in Sardinia, one's in Japan. In these places, the average age is 90, 95 plus in terms of older people. They've studied these people to death. They've bled them dry. 
to try and find out why. Guess what a common trait of these three places is? Empowered women is a feature of all three places. We're learning about how to promote longevity in the human species. I, lo I love this one. Look at this. You love this now. You ready for this? There's endless studies of happiness. You know, people always study happiness. And the truth is, you're happiest in your early 20s, then it plummets down, and it bottoms out in your early 50s, and then it gets better again. Isn't that great? Loads of studies. You don't know why this is. You might be straight, gay, married, single. You follow that curve. If you're depressed, wait. Okay, let's get back. <laughs> now, finally, because time is against me, uh, the future. Let's talk about the future. Uh, many things here, of course, and we'd hope to... That's a big topic at this conference, of course it is. Medicines. I work on, on immunology. I'm an immunologist trying to find brand new medicines. Alexander Fleming has saved at least 100 million lives with the discovery of antibiotics. Um, look at this now. This is a great slide just for you guys who made this specially. Um, things are getting better, you know. You mightn't think it, but the world is getting better. This is called the demographic transition. On one axis is number of babies born per woman, right? On the vertical, uh, the, the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis, it's infant mortality. This is the year 1866. In most countries in the world, half the babies died, right? And the average numbers of kids per woman was six, okay? So high birth rate, high mortality. Year on year, it all collapses down. Look at this, look at this, down to 2018. What this means is, the average woman is now having two children and there's a zero uh, mortality rate. So it's a fantastic example of progress. Less babies dying, you know, wonderful example of, of things going right. Medicines are being discovered. This woman, Gertrude Elion, discovered cures for herpes and for gout, for example. So it's a great example. Many new medicines are being developed by many different people, and that's my area, you know. There's no doubt we will have cures for all these big diseases that afflict us. And then finally, death. And you're all going to die. You mightn't like it unless you freeze yourself in cryonics. That's a bit expensive. I uh, wouldn't be recommending it. And there might be extinctions. As you know, there's mass extinctions happening on the Earth at the moment. The dinosaurs were wiped out 60 million years ago. They think it's a meteorite. This could be the real reason. They smoked. Um, and there's many species dying. There's a great Irish elk was wiped out. Five extinction events in the past. And now we're causing this massive extinction event. The UN has said, watch out. There's massive extinctions happening. And of course, we're causing it. That's the worst part of this. And um, look at all these animals are at risk of extinction. So it's a really terrifying thing. This is the consensus among scientists that we are causing this. It's at least 97%. Now, how do you get that level of um, agreement among scientists? So everybody agrees we're the cause. What can we do about it? There's Ireland. If we don't stop in the year 2100, there'll be lots of water everywhere. And to, you know, I said, tell your politicians this, obviously, reuse, recycle, reduce. And let me finish with a couple of quick quotes for you. So Bob Dylan, famous thing. Remember the song, The Times They Are Changing? He didn't realize it, but he was talking about climate change. He says, look at this. Come gather around people wherever you roam and admit that the waters around you have grown and accept that, it, that soon you'll be drenched to the bone if your time is worth saving. You better start swimming and you'll sink like a stone. The last verse of that song is the following. There's old Greta, who you know about, right? Here's Ireland protesting. Look at the last verse. Come mothers and fathers throughout the land and don't criticize what you can't understand. Your sons and your daughters are beyond your command. Your old daughters are the aging. Please get out of the new one if you can't lend a hand. And that's the message, right? You've got to, we've got to respond to this crisis that's happening. Now, let me finish on if that nightmare is happening. Science will save us, remember. Science being this wonderful activity. What science is, is curiosity and discovering stuff and then hoping that will make a difference to humans. And all through history, that's what science has done. The Large Hadron Collider, 55,000 scientists from 42 countries are collaborating. They've discovered a type of energy in that machine. If you can capture it, it would fuel the Earth for a month, this type of energy, this single little piece of energy. Fantastic, you know, and it's a really good example. And then, of course, we have Boris came to visit us. I have to show that, don't I? He came to Trinity. He's pretty stupid. We'll move on quickly. Um, there's the International Space Station, great science happening there. Now, the second thing is, so science is very important, right? The second thing that's really important is education. I want to finish on this. So, you know, we need teachers. And in my book, the last chapter, a big shout out for teachers. They unleash potential in young people. They're the ones who inspire and get someone to, you know, live a full life, if you like. And this woman, you've all heard of her, I hope, Malala Yousafzai, defied the Taliban, you know. And teachers will educate the engineers, the doctors, the scientists, the artists. Of course, we need the humanities more than ever, you know. So teaching is really, really important. And last summer, I was interviewed about the book on RT Radio. 
And I mentioned how I was inspired by a biology teacher called, called uh, Mr. Mooney, we call him. I, I'm from Bray County, Wicklow. And in my school there, Mr. Mooney was my biology teacher. He told me all about DNA. And my mind was blown by DNA, right? And I then mentioned this on the radio. And then I got a letter from him. This is from Mr. Mooney. Handwritten letter. Obviously, he has not entered the 21st century. And he says, uh, my daughter told me about you on the radio, mentioning me. Thanks very much, he says, for mentioning me. I hear you're giving a lecture next month in Dublin. I might come and see you, okay? Now, a month later, I'm giving a lecture in Smock Alley, and halfway through, I say, uh, is Mr. Mooney here? And he was four rows back, and he went, sir, 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 sir. And I said, Mr. Mooney, what can I say? And I said, thank you very much, and I, you know, mentioned the, the link to him. A massive round of applause for Mr. Mooney. At the very end, he came up to me, and he's walking towards me, and I put my hand out, and he grabbed me, and he hugged me, and he held me for about a minute. Right? Now, if you're an Irish man, that's unnerving. I'm looking around going, what the hell? And then we separated, and he said, I don't remember you. <laughs> so that was a bit so. <laughs> and there's me and Mr. Mooney. Isn't that nice? <laughs> he said, that was Mr. Mooney. <laughs> um, I'm honest, honest to God, we're in a church. Honest to God, I wouldn't be here without him when I was like 16 years of age, and he told me about DNA. So teachers are very, very important. Now, where does that leave us? Well, um, as I say, the job of science is to make discoveries, to make things better for humanity, and that's what the purpose of this adventure is for the next generations. You know, I work on medical research. If we could find a treatment for Parkinson's disease, you work on, what a difference that would make to society. It'd save all this money for the start and stop suffering. You know, so science is all about trying to make a difference. And you must join us on this mission. Uh, this is what we know, you know, that little white bit, no freaking idea. You know, we're just beginning in many ways. And if we continue down this path, if we boldly go where no one's gone before, right, that's what science does, we might finally reach Spock's dream of live long and prosper. Thanks very much.